Good morning. Tomorrow, House Republicans are honored to host at our special political conference, President Donald J. Trump, where we will discuss how Republicans will work together to save America from Joe Biden and far-left Democrats' failed leadership that has caused skyrocketing and painful Biden inflation, the historic Biden border crisis, surging violent crime, a weakened national security, and chaos around the world. This week on the floor, House Republicans are delivering on our promise to hold the Biden administration accountable when we bring to the floor our resolution to hold Attorney General Merrick Garland in contempt of Congress for refusing to comply with our subpoena and release the audio recordings of Joe Biden's interview with Special Counsel Robert Herr. It's time for Merrick Garland to stop stonewalling and release the Biden tapes. Additionally, we will bring to the floor the National Defense Bill for FY25 and as a senior member of the House Armed Services Committee, I'm proud to have helped craft this legislation, securing critical wins for my home district for Fort Drum, the 10th Mountain Division, and all of upstate New York. This bill also includes significant investments in emerging technology, provides for our military families, equips our service members with modern capabilities and platforms as they fight to protect our nation and deter our adversaries. I also want to quickly touch upon yesterday's deposition of corrupt former disgraced New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, whose fatal nursing home order resulted in the deaths of over 15,000 innocent seniors dying in nursing homes. This was a long overdue step for those families who are still mourning the loss of their loved ones in New York State. We will continue to fight to deliver justice and accountability and answers for those families who are still grieving. Thank you to Chairman Brad Wenstrup of the Select Committee for making yesterday possible. With that, I'm honored to be joined by my colleagues today, and I want to turn it over to Mark Alford, who will be talking about the National Defense Bill. Mark Alford from Missouri. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you, Mr. Speaker, and all my colleagues up here. Hey, this is a good day in America, and I'm so honored to be on the Armed Services Committee. Uh, folks, we are at a critical, critical time in our nation's history. Our military plays a, a vital role in shaping the future of American freedom, safety, and security, while also ensuring that a Western rules-based order remains the foundation to a stable world. This year, we have focused on three major components in the National Defense Authorization Act, the NDAA, enhancing U.S. deterrence, countering China's aggression, and improving the quality of life for our service members. China's aggression is the greatest national security threat to America today. To deter China and other adversaries, we're investing in key platforms like the B-21 Stealth Raider, which is being built right now in Palmdale, California, and will eventually be housed, uh, one of the three bases, at Whiteman Air Force Base in the 4th Congressional District of Missouri, which I represent. This NDAA strengthens our military assets in the Indo-Pacific by increasing shipbuilding capacity and authorizing two Virginia-class submarines. The FY25 NDAA will also increase junior enlisted service members' pay by almost 20 percent, enhance housing for service members, boost pay and benefits for child care staff, expand access to medical care for service members. The foundation of this year's NDAA is the quality of life for those who serve. And I'm so uh, glad to be a part of the quality of life panel that General J uh, Don Bacon chaired under the direction of Chairman Rogers for the Armed Services Committee. This is so important to our committee. This is a bipartisan bill to improve the quality of life for those who are willing to serve and possibly die for our great nation. Now is the time to come together, to come together to pass the FY25 NDAA and strengthen America's defense, deter our adversaries, and support the brave men and women who defend our freedom. I'd like to bring out the chair of the Judiciary Committee now, Chair Jim Jordan. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, last September, the Speaker of the House announced that the uh, House of Representatives would be entering an impeachment inquiry phase of our oversight work. On December 13th, the full House of Representatives voted to, to do just that, to formalize that. Um, this is a power that is exclusively, uh, exclusively resides in the House of Representatives and one of the most important powers that we have as, a, as an institution and as a body. Um, Robert Hur on page one of his special counsel report 
said Joe Biden knowingly kept classified information. Joe Biden knowingly disclosed classified information, and he disclosed that information to someone who wasn't allowed to get it. Page 231, he told us he told us why Joe Biden did those things. He said Joe Biden had strong motivations for ignoring classified procedures because he was writing a book, a book for which he got paid eight million dollars. So we have motive, an eight million dollar motive. We have the elements of the crime, knowingly keeping, knowingly disclosing, giving that information to someone who wasn't allowed to get it. We have all that. And yet the special counsel said he would not recommend charges for uh, President Biden. We think we're entitled to we don't, we don't think we know we're entitled to all the evidence. And that includes the best evidence, which is this audio tape. That's why we sent the subpoena. The attorney general is being clear. He's not going to give that information to us. So um, that's why we have the contempt resolution. We assume this is going to wind up in court, but we think our case is strong and we think that we will prevail. But step one is to pass the resolution holding the attorney general in contempt for not giving the House of Representatives the body who's in an impeachment inquiry phase of our oversight responsibilities, not giving us the best evidence. Finally, I would just say this. We think the privilege has already been waived. We think when they uh, gave us the transcript, they've waived the privilege. And understand that there have already been times where the transcript that we've received from the White House doesn't match up with what was actually said by the President of the United States. And so, again, for all those reasons, <laughs> Uh, we think we need this information, and that's why the resolution will be on the floor today. And I'll let the next gentleman talk about the vote on that, and that's our good whip, Tom Emmerich. Thank you, Jim. So the question that should be asked is, what are they hiding and why? These are fundamental questions behind House Republicans' resolution this week to hold Attorney General Merrick Garland in contempt of Congress for refusing to comply with our lawfully issued subpoenas. To set the scene, Attorney General Garland handpicked special counsel Robert Herr and Jack Smith to oversee the investigations into Joe Biden and Donald Trump's handling of classified documents. Herr concluded that although President Biden, quote, willfully retained and disclosed classified materials as a private citizen, close quote, criminal charges were not warranted because Biden is an, quote, elderly man with a poor memory. In stark contrast, former President Donald Trump was hit with a 37-count indictment from Special Counsel Smith alleging that he willfully retained classified documents after leaving office. Second, the White House has a history. I'm sorry. Second, in accordance with our legislative oversight authority of special counsels and impeachment inquiry into President Biden, House Republicans on the Judiciary and Oversight Committee subpoenaed Attorney General Garland for records, including transcripts, notes, video, and audio files related to special counsel Robert Hur's investigation in order to assess his conclusions. And while the Justice Department handed over the transcript of Biden's interview with Hur, they've denied and refused to hand over the corresponding audio recordings. This is a problem for a couple of reasons. First, transcripts do not and cannot capture things like tone, inflection, pace, and pauses that fully convey a person's message. The audio recordings are necessary to adequately evaluate special counsel Her's assessment about President Biden's memory and to determine whether the DOJ is engaging in a two-tiered application of justice by refusing to indict Joe Biden. Second, the White House has a history of editing official transcripts to cover up Biden's gaffes. If the interview audio matches the transcript, why not release it? Why not comply with our subpoenas? Is Biden's Department of Justice covering, <laughs> covering their boss? These are all imperative questions that our committees will get to the bottom of, and this week's contempt resolution is a vital step in that effort. I encourage all of my colleagues to vote yes on this important issue, and with that, I turn it over to our leader, Steve Scalise. Well, thank you, Whip. We have another busy week on the floor, and of course it starts with the contempt of Merrick Garland, and then my colleagues have talked about this is something that we have been uh, trying to get the facts out for months and months. Uh, Merrick Garland knows what the rules are. Uh, he issues subpoenas himself, and he doesn't let the person 
that he's issuing the subpoena to decide whether or not they want to comply. And yet that's what he said. He said he just doesn't think that this is something that he has to comply with. Well, with all due respect, Mr. Garland, this is not your decision. Congress has a constitutional duty to perform oversight, which is what we're doing. We're in the middle of an impeachment inquiry, which, as Chairman Jordan pointed out, has been voted on by the House already. And now we need to get the facts. Uh, you look at the White House themselves. They've acknowledged that as they've turned over the transcripts, those transcripts have been edited. Well, there's one way you can find out what the edits were, and that is to actually get the source tape, get the audio. That's the only way we're going to know what was really said. We know already by the White House's own admission that the transcript does not reflect what was said. It's only the audio that does, which is why we need to get the audio tape. And clearly there's no executive privilege. Otherwise, it's been pointed out they wouldn't have turned over the transcript in the first place. But they've done it. But they've also acknowledged that they've edited the document that they turned over to us. Now we need to get the source document, which is the audio. And that's why we're moving forward. Uh, we're also taking up the NDAA, as Mr. Alford talked about. Really, really important that we send a message to our men and women in uniform that we're going to give them all the tools necessary, not only to keep our country safe, uh, but to make sure that they and their families uh, have the things that they need so they don't have to be on food stamps, for example, uh, to increase their base pay for the entry level uh, men and women in uniform and all the branches of the military uh, to make sure that we're focused properly on China and the threats that are posed all around the world. Uh, look, the world's a more dangerous place than it's ever been. We saw that again this morning uh, with the arrest of eight, eight ISIS fighters here in the United States because Joe Biden opened up the southern border. Uh, if anybody wondered, and we've been saying this uh, for years now, that because Joe Biden opened up the border, at some point our country will be at risk and our national security is undermined. And it was pointed out yet again uh, with eight ISIS fighters caught. How many more terrorists are in our country because Joe Biden opened up the southern border, uh, prepositioned in cities around this country, getting ready to do us harm? Uh, so it just goes to show you the world is a very dangerous place. We need to make sure we have the tools. We ought to be working with the president to secure our southern border, but the president doesn't want to secure the border. In fact, under his own executive order, he's going to let another million people in a year without ending the policies that are drawing people here illegally. Uh, we passed a bill, H.R. 2, that would fix this problem, and Joe Biden still to this day opposes that bill. After eight ISIS terrorists were captured in America, Joe Biden still opposes the bill that would secure America's southern border. So it's very clear he does not want to solve the problem. You know somebody is that does want to solve the problem? That's Donald Trump. President Trump had a secure border. Uh, he's going to be here tomorrow, and I'm sure we're going to hear about some of those things that we're all trying to work on together uh, to get our economy back on track, to secure our border, uh, to make sure our military is focused on the things that need to be done to get this country back on track. So we're going to continue working to address these problems. I will finish with this. You know, we had an opportunity, a few, about 60 House members over the last week to go to Normandy and pay tribute to the, uh, the brave, brave heroes who stormed the beaches of Normandy. Uh, so many lost their lives that day. Uh, and you can see the cost of our freedom when you're on that beach and you see the grave sites. But we also got to see something that was incredibly inspiring. That was about 135 uh, of those men who are still alive uh, who came back to Normandy. And you want to talk about a special moment to, to be able to meet and greet and thank those 135 uh, brave men for their service. And some of them were in their hundreds. The youngest one I met was 97 years old, and they all were recounting stories of, of that day. And then the French president, President Macron, uh, went one by one. He selected a few of them to give the, uh, the Chevalier de Légionnaire, one of the France's highest awards, uh, to a number of those brave heroes. And he cited the things that they did. And again, these are American heroes who went to another country not to conquer, but to liberate, uh, to restore freedom uh, to the French people who were under Nazi regime. And, uh, and he pinned each one of them individually. And to see uh, they were all in wheelchairs, and to see them get out of their wheelchair uh, because of the pride, they did not want to sit down while the French president was presenting those medals. 
And it just uh, it just showed you why they're called the greatest generation. And it was a, it was an unbelievably uh, moving moment. And uh, I know we, we have a lot of things around here that we uh, we talk about the battles and the fights amongst ourselves. But that was a time where the country came together and, and people did extraordinary things. And it just proves America can do those kind of things when we put our minds to it. Um, hope you all come out to the baseball game tonight. The Republicans play the Democrats. We have over twenty five thousand tickets sold and uh, exceeding the record. Over $2 million raised for local charities. A lot of local youth groups will benefit. Uh, we're the reigning champs, and we want to continue to hold that mantle. But uh, you're going to see a, a spirited competition tonight. Hope to see you all there. I know somebody will be out there because he was at practice this morning, was our speaker, Mike Johnson. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Leader, and thanks all of you for being here this morning. There's a central theme in what you've heard uh, this morning, a couple of themes, but one of them, of course, is the security of America. And I just want to begin where uh, the, the leader uh, was was talking about the, the border. The, the Biden uh, border catastrophe continues in spite of his his window dressing of the executive order. Uh, nothing's changed, of course. In fact, uh, many have argued <clears throat> that this increased uh, the incentives for people to try to come and, 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 and you know, uh, avail themselves of the welcome mat that the Biden administration has put forward. And you, you saw and you heard that eight uh, ISIS uh, affiliated persons have been apprehended. The open border has welcomed many dangerous people, and none of us, none of us knows exactly how many of them are here, may have set up terrorist cells in America, because the border has been wide open for three and a half years, as we've recounted here every week upon week upon week. We're demanding actual executive action from the, the president, and he is unwilling to provide it, and so Americans are in danger because of that. Uh, they're in danger for lots of reasons, and that's why the NDAA this week is so important, and you've heard a lot of discussion about that. I want to thank uh, Chairman Rogers, Chairman Burgess of the House Armed Services Committee and the Rules Committee, who did heavy lifts to get this bill prepared for floor action, and the Armed Services Committee that did extraordinary work. Um, this is an important bill because it's, it's going to support our brave service members. And it will do a number of things. It will ensure that our men and women in uniform can enjoy a high quality of life, as you've heard recounted here. And, and also the NDAA will restore the focus of our military on lethality. That's what the military is about. It will strengthen our defense industrial base. It will deploy innovative wartime technologies for the 21st century and support the National Guard to intercept drugs and illegal aliens at the border. Right now, we're working through amendments and looking forward to bringing that bill forward with broad support. And uh, there are about 350 amendments that Congress will be working through, and uh, that will happen over the next couple of days in the midst of all the other activity here. Uh, I want to just say a quick word about the Israeli hostage rescue. Um, we've not had a press conference since that occurred, uh, and the D.C. protests that go right along with that. Over the weekend, members of the IDF showed heroism and intact and bravery, and they rescued four Israelis who are being held hostage in, in Gaza, as we all know. We, of course, rejoice that they're safely home, and we continue to push for the release of all hostages, including the Americans who are still kept there. Uh, outside a New York memorial for October 7th victims, shamefully, protesters chanted, long live the Antifada, and outside the White House, vandals and aspiring, apparently aspiring Hamas members chanted, Hezbollah, Hezbollah, and, quote, kill another Zionist now. Yeah, that happened in Lafayette Park. Plain and simple, it's dangerous behavior, and it's disgusting that the Metro PD didn't arrest anyone on Sunday. Um, we're talking about another theme, and that is the administration of justice in this country. And the contempt of Merrick Garland is a very important principle here. This week on the House floor, as you heard, Chairman Jordan and, and our leader and our whip uh, discussed, we'll be holding Attorney General Garland in contempt of Congress. He is refusing, refusing to comply with a lawful subpoena, and that's a problem under Article I. We have to defend the Constitution. We have to defend the authority of Congress. We can't allow the Department of Justice, an executive branch agency, to hide information from Congress. We have important oversight responsibilities, and that is what is being pursued here. As you heard Chairman Jordan say, um, we, we have oversight of special counsels as well, and we have a right to know if Robert Hur's recommendation against prosecuting President Biden was warranted. And the best evidence, as, as Chairman Jordan said, was the audio recordings because they provide critical insight in what that transcript itself cannot provide. 
we have to know if the transcript is accurate. And as a former litigator, I can tell you, and many of us know intuitively, that when you have a, a printed transcript that someone transcribed, you don't know with 100% certainty whether it actually lines up with the audio recording, and that's why this is so important. Uh, the Attorney General doesn't get to decide whether he hides the tape, and that's what will be um, determined here. Um, I, I do want to... Uh, I, there's a couple of things else that we wanted to talk about this morning, but I'll save it for questions. I, I can anticipate what some of them will be. I do want to say, though, at, on a brighter note at the baseball field this morning, Republicans and Democrats out there in a great spirit. The weather's beautiful. Tonight will be a great game. You should come out. Two million dollars, in excess of two million dollars, to be raised for charity. And uh, it's something that unites everybody, for, at least for, for one night of the year. So we uh, certainly encourage you to come out. It'll be about, some, by some estimates, about 27,000 people that watch that game tonight. So it would be a lot of fun. Uh, with that, we'll yield uh, to some questions. Front row. Two quick questions for you, thank you. Um, first question, how confident are you that this vote to hold Garland in contempt will pass? And also, some Republicans are pushing for legislation that would allow current and former presidents to move a state case to federal courts. Do you believe that ne that legislation is necessary? Would you put that on the floor for a vote? Yeah, we're working through uh, with members bringing that to the floor. I'll address them in reverse order. Um, I, I think it's an important principle. It, it Currently, that is the rule for members of Congress. If, if you're uh, sued, you can transfer it to federal court. It seems to make a lot of sense. Um, again, we're trying to preserve the integrity of the justice system, and we've seen some of these local and state prosecutors abuse that system. We've talked about it here many times. I won't recount all of it again, but I, I think that's a, a, an idea that makes sense. It makes sense to uh, most Republicans, and I think all, almost everyone will be in favor of that, and that's what we're talking about and trying to move some of this forward. To address the two-tiered system of justice in this country, as we've talked about, we basically have a three-pronged approach. We're, of course, aggressively pursuing the oversight responsibility that we have. We've talked about this morning. We are looking at other legislation, and, of course, we have the appropriations. And uh, we're going to utilize every tool that we have in our arsenal because we're required to do so under the Constitution, and I think that's a part of it. And in pursuit of that, I do think the contempt um, – of, of Merrick Garland will uh, will pass on the floor, and we're anxious to have that happen. Second row, yes, ma'am. Thank you, Speaker Johnson. I'm just wondering, with Trump coming tomorrow, what do you anticipate if he does win in November about his relationship with congressional Republicans? Do you think it'll be similar to his first term, or do you think you'll see more involvement, more coordination, more receptivity on this end? Yeah, I, look, I think it's important for the country to have us to have close coordination. I, I, I've said many times I believe President Trump in his second term, which I believe he'll have, can be the most consequential president of the modern era because we have to fix effectively every area of public policy. The Biden administration has made a disaster of almost every area, which is why uh, the polling is, is uh, so uh, in favor of the president, uh, President Trump, right now. And, and I think when he comes in, we've got to have a very aggressive first 100 days agenda. The first year will be important. I think we cannot waste a moment because there's so many things to do. So in light of that, we're having discussions with he and his team now and amongst ourselves to plan accordingly. You don't put the cart before the horse, but you do have to be prepared to lead, and we're going to be prepared. And, and I, uh, I, I can't wait for that um, eventuality to, to come forward. If you look at the latest polling. Everyone, uh, almost everyone now is projecting that the Republicans will retake the Senate, that we will grow the House majority, and that we'll have the White House as well. And when you have unified government like that, it comes with great responsibility, and we look forward to those days and, and, and fixing lots and lots of things. So, uh, yeah, coordination is important. Third row. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> I think Chip Roy, Bob got a couple other conservatives have raised the idea of passing a CR ahead of funding deadlines in October. Have you discussed that possibility with the president? Where do you stand on that possibility? We're, we're talking about that and a number of possibilities. There are pros and cons to all these approaches. Um, I mean, w one of the, the initial concerns would be if you put that into, let's say, the spring of next year, um, that would uh, encumber the calendar a little bit if we're having to deal with appropriations in that first 100 days when we have all these other uh, things that we want to be doing. So we're trying to balance all those, those interests and, and do what is the most responsible thing for the country, uh, fiscally responsible and, and by policy as well. So there's lots of thoughtful discussion uh, going on, very productive discussion going on on our side on, on what we'll ultimately do on that, but we'll keep you posted. Yes, sir. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Um, you and Leader Scalise talked about the importance of Merrick Garland complying with a congressional subpoena. I'm curious, since Chairman Jordan and four other colleagues declined to do that under the January 6th committee, if you worry that undermines the argument at all? Oh, I'm so glad you brought up the January 6th committee. We'll be talking a lot more about that in the coming weeks. There's been a lot of investigation about that committee. I don't think it was properly constituted. I don't think it was uh, – 
it was has properly administered, and now we know that um, apparently some of the evidence was hidden and some maybe even destroyed. So you'll see, you'll hear much more about that in the days ahead. Uh, you talk about apples to oranges. Um, there couldn't be a more clear contrast between that and what we're talking about here. This is this is the Judiciary Committee. This is the Weaponization Committee. These are properly constituted and operating committees under Chairman Jordan's leadership. Have done extraordinary work, methodically, constitutionally, appropriately. And now we come to this impasse with the Attorney General himself, who refuses to comply. Look, this is an Article One issue. We've got to get it um, uh, covered well, and I think we will. And I think that's why this contempt um, will pass on the floor. So. Um, one last question. Very back. Back row. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, back to former President Trump and with his arrival here, you know, near the Capitol, really for the first time, Republicans are both the House and Senate meeting with him since the January 6th attack um, on the Capitol. Are you committed or have you spoken to him about basically not, not doing anything like that again and committing to... Um, respecting the sort of American tradition of a peaceful transfer of presidency. Of course he respects that, and we all do, and, and we've all talked about it ad nauseum. We're, we're excited to welcome the, uh, President Trump uh, back. Uh, he'll be meet, meeting with the Senate Republicans, of course, after he has a, a breakfast with us. And there's high anticipation here and great excitement. Um, and I feel, look, we, we feel that, as I've mentioned, I've been all across the country, crisscrossing the country, and all the districts of all these campaigns, and there's a real energy in the base right now and a real energy among the American people. They know that change is coming. It can't get here soon enough. November cannot get here soon enough. But we're anxious to, uh, to talk about that and, and, uh, and, and uh, I guess, bounce around ideas with the president tomorrow. Looking forward to uh, welcoming him right after the congressional baseball game. It's a big week here and lots of good feeling. So with that, we'll leave you all. Thanks so much for being here.